So why write? Well, write because you have a story to tell. Um, write because there's something that you want to say and it's in your heart and you want to tell a story. Writing because you want to still tell a story is a great reason to write. Um, so write because you're a storyteller. Write because you have a passion to do it. Write because you want to share something with the world that's in your heart and it's it needs to get out there. Um, write because you tell stories that move you and you hope that they'll move somebody else too. Um, and that is the reason to write because you tell stories and that's your passion. Um, and if that's why you write, then all the rest is just cake, you know? <laughs> if someone pays you for it, hey, bonus. <laughs> um, that being said, once you decide to write, there's a lot of stuff you hear. Um, and you get advice coming at you from like all kinds of different directions. I mean like all kinds of different directions. <laughs> um, and some of it's conflicting. Actually a lot of it's conflicting. Yeah. <laughs> um, some of the best advice I ever got, um, write what you love, don't chase the market. Um, Cause the market isn't, doesn't matter. I mean it does, because if you want to sell your stuff. But if you're chasing the market, it's going to change and it doesn't matter because, why I say it doesn't matter is because if you're not writing what you love, then it's not going to be genuine and it's not going to be your voice. And your voice is what matters. And that's why I say the market doesn't matter, because what matters is your voice. Um, so write your story, be a storyteller and write your story. Um, and the next most important piece of advice I got is don't give up. Uh, you're going to get a lot of rejection <laughs> once you decide to write. Um, it just comes with the territory. <laughs> it just does. But the fun part of that is that then you get the one that's not a rejection and that's so cool <laughs> and then you get to have a party because <laughs> it's really fun or the, the really fun one okay so I'll tell you the story right because I like to tell stories <laughs> excuse me one second <clears throat> Okay, so the first short story I wrote, I, um, I, we just moved to Seattle. This was um, eight years ago now. Yeah, eight years ago next month. And I wrote this short story, and we were going to attend this writing conference. Now, the whole reason that we decided to attend this writing conference was because. Um, an author that I really liked was going to be there. And the writing conference was in Surrey, British Columbia, not that far away. And I said, you know, oh, we could, I could go to this writing conference and I could meet this author that I really like. She's going to be there. She's going to be signing books. And my husband said, well, you're a writer. You should go to the conference. And, you know, that thought had never crossed my mind. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> and then he said, oh, you know, they have a, a, a short story contest. You should enter the contest. Uh, again, that, that thought had never crossed my mind. I said, no, I write novels. I don't write short stories. I don't know how to write a short story. That was my thinking. I, I was like, I don't know how to do that. Wow. Under 5,000 words. <laughs> my, my, my first novel was 100,000 words long, and it lives in a filing cabinet. <laughs> um, right. And my second novel was close to that. It also lives in a filing cabinet. <laughs> um, even Red and Gray, the first time I wrote it, was 120,000 words long. And, and then my publisher said, you need to cut about 20,000 words. And <laughs> so yeah, that was fun. <clears throat> but so I said, okay, well, I guess I could try that. So I, I wrote a short story. 
and I sent it to some friends and I asked them for some feedback and I added it the short story. And then I get an email that says, you've been shortlisted in the contest. And I'm like, no way. <laughs> That's so cool. I get my shiny star sticker. <laughs> my first short story got shortlisted. Yay. And then I get a phone call and they say, are you sitting down? I'm like, no, do I need to be? And they're like, yeah. So I sit down and they say, we're calling to tell you that you won. Oh. The Surrey International Writers Conference. Oh, and I'm like, and I, the, according to my children, <laughs> this is their account, I start screaming. <laughs> and um, my husband was still asleep at the time, so all he hears is screaming. <laughs> and he doesn't know what's happening. <laughs> um, but um, yes, I was quite tickled. Um, that my first short story won the contest. Um, and um, I just couldn't believe it. I was amazed um, because I didn't think I could write a short story. I was like, I write 100,000 word novels. What are you talking about? I don't know how to write a short story. So yeah, I was thrilled. Um, and so every once in a while you get the call and every once in a while you get accepted by the publisher. So don't give up. Um, it's hard, but it's worth it totally worth it because <laughs> you get the call <laughs> um, and um, don't listen when people say oh that's so nice when you tell them you're a writer because you get that a lot oh that's nice <laughs> and that feels a little discouraging you know it's like oh good job <laughs> you're like wait no I, I meant it I, I really am a writer Seriously, really, I'm a writer. Do, do you know what that means? <laughs> you know, it doesn't sound like much, but it, it, it can be hard work. And yeah, I, I really do enjoy it, but still, it's hard work. <laughs> yes, I, I do it because I'm passionate about it and because it is fun and it, it is what I love to do. But yeah, it's still hard work. <laughs> Don't discredit my goals and ambitions. Don't pat me on the head. <laughs> so when people do that, let it go. Let it roll off your back. And I know I sound like I'm just saying, oh, don't do this and don't do that and don't do this, but there are some do's too. <laughs> um, writing is storytelling. So write the story that makes sense to you. Write the story you love. And do have fun with it. Because, you know, writing should be it should be fun. It should be something that gives you joy. Um, it, it, yes, it is hard work. <laughs> um, it is real work, but it's fun too. You know, it's something that you can have fun with. And writing the story that you love will be something that gives you joy. So I guess that brings me to why fairy tales. Um, <laughs> Why did I get into writing fairy tales? Well, because I really like fairy tales. <laughs> um, I've liked fairy tales since I was a little girl. Um, a couple of my favorites are Beauty and the Beast and the Twelve Dancing Princesses, and um, um, not the Barbie version. <laughs> Sorry, Willow Weave. <laughs> not the Barbie version. <laughs> um, the original fairy tale. <laughs> um, I have I had these beautifully illustrated books when I was a kid. Of, of Beauty and the Beast and the Twelve Dancing Princesses. They were just they were gorgeous, gorgeous books with beautiful illustrations. Um, and then The Little Mermaid, um, although I actually, I know everyone's gonna poo poo me, but I really, I do like the Disney version of The Little Mermaid. I know, when you break. She has red hair. She was the first red-headed Disney princess, okay? I was like, oh my gosh, she's just like me. <laughs> But yeah, and also it actually does end better than the original fairy tale of the Little Mermaid, okay? You know, because the original one didn't end all that well. <laughs> so, really. <laughs> what was that? Better for happy endings. Yeah, it's better, yeah. <laughs> and hey, I'm a sucker for happy endings. <laughs> I like the happy endings. Um, but um, yeah, so. Um, but those are a couple of my favorites. So then 
I know, you're thinking, well, wait, why rewrite Little Red Riding Hood then? Because that's not on your <laughs> list of favorites. Um, okay, so I'll get to that. But um, just so you know, I have plans in the works for rewriting The Twelve Dancing Princesses, which I'm doing right now as the sequel to Red and Gray, and to rewrite Beauty and the Beast, which will be the third book in the series. <laughs> um, um, so Little Red Riding Hood started it all because I had to know the answer to a question. Why did the wolf want the food? Why? I mean, really, he's a wolf. He can go out and hunt his own food, right? I mean, seriously. Why did he want the food in her basket? What was so good about the food in her basket that he had to have it? Letter. Well, there's that too. <laughs> if you read the original fairy tale, there's a there's a heavy inclination of that. No, I was I mean, meaning for food. Yeah. yeah, but no, there. I mean that he wanted to eat her, and he wanted to eat the grandmother. And in the original fairy tale, the grim fairy tale, he does. And oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the grim in in the in the brothers grim version of the fairy tale, he does eat them both. Uh, fairy tales are very dark. <laughs> fairy tales are very dark. Um, in the Brothers Grimm version of the fairy tale, he eats both the grandmother and Little Red Riding Hood. And then the woodcutter comes along. He hears the wolf snoring, and he thinks, oh, the grandmother's snoring really loudly. I better go check on her. Um, and he goes into the cottage and finds the wolf asleep in the grandmother's bed. And he comes in, and he thinks, oh, I should. His stomach's really swollen. I'll bet he ate the grandmother. I should cut his stomach open. <laughs> and he does and out pops little red riding hood and the grandmother both fine <laughs> yeah he, he swallowed them home <laughs> and little red riding hood says oh i was scared it was dark in there <laughs> yeah it's a fairy tale you know and uh and um they they say oh well, we don't want the wolf to get away when he wakes up so they fill his stomach with rocks and so it shut. Yeah. <laughs> True story. This is the Brothers Grimm fairy tale. Their yeah. name befits them. Hmm? Their name befits them, the Grimm brothers. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so, um, and then the wolf wakes up and his stomach is all full of rocks and he can't go anywhere because his stomach is full of rocks and he dies. Um, yeah. It's very dark. Pretty grim. Yeah, pretty grim. <laughs> so I wanted to ask the question, why does the wolf want the food? And at this point, if it's okay with you guys, I'd like to read you some from my story. Um, but I'm not sure I can do it while I hold the mic. That's the only problem. Hold the mic for you or something? Um, I'm gonna try it. Let's okay. see if I can do it. So I normally read the chapter where uh, the wolf first sees red. Um, and I was considering doing that tonight. But I was also thinking about reading the chapter where um, my main character actually becomes a wolf. So I'll put it to you guys for a vote. Who wants the chapter where he becomes a wolf? Just a number of hands there. Who wants the chapter where he first sees red for the first time? Okay, the chapter where he becomes a wolf wins. See, my kids voted for that one because they've already heard the chapter where he first sees. <laughs> so they outnumbered y'all. <laughs> All right, so this is actually the second chapter of the book. Pounding dragged Connor from sleep the next morning. Dark dreams of golden wolf eyes haunted his sleep and woke him often during the previous night. Connor, get up, his father demanded from the other side of the, his door. Connor stumbled out of his tangled sheets and opened his door. His father stood tapping his foot. Your mother is worse. She needs medicine. Go fetch it. Of course, father. Connor tried to ignore the chill that raced up his spine. 
he knew it had little to do with the cool spring air. Getting his mother's medicine meant a visit to the witch woman's house. An adult and an apprentice blacksmith, the witch should not terrify him the way she did. The sun was not yet above the horizon when Connor left the house, but the sky was no longer black. Instead, air seemed, the air seemed almost gray, shifting into lighter shades while he walked, as if the sunlight filtered through the remaining bits of night. Leaving the town center, Connor passed more homes with dark windows and doors still closed, no doubt barred. He continued through the cobbled street on his way out of town. The witch lived beyond the town limits. Her house set back off the, doubt, off the dirt road, close to the woods on the mountainside. She was not far from where they had hunted the wolf. People claimed she could bless or curse a person at will and paid her quite well to buy her spells. <clears throat> Connor remembered hiding behind his mother's skirts the first time he met the witch. Both women had laughed, calling him shy. In his mind, since that day, the town had started to change. It became a darker, heavier place. People stopped trusting each other. People, oh, I lost my voice, sorry. <laughs> People stopped trusting each other helping each other, and caring for each other, unless they had something to gain. More people got sick, more children died. He tried to tell people, but they laughed at his fears, or worse. He learned soon enough to hold his tongue. Connor tapped on the witch's door. It opened too quickly, as if she knew someone was coming. Her face twisted into a smile when she saw him. He clenched his hands and forced himself to stand straighter, meeting her pale green eyes. He hated her eyes and met them only when he had to. They made his head hurt. Connor, is your mother having an episode, child? Her head tilted to one side and her eyes roamed over his body, the look calculated. But not so much a child anymore. Yes, ma'am. Connor had no idea what to say to the woman. He did not like the way her gaze sized him up. Come in, boy. No reason to stand outside. Connor hesitated, but she motioned him in again. You need to come in. It, t it will take me a few moments to get the herbs together for your mother's medicine. Connor shuffled inside the doorway, jamming his hands into the pocket of his pants. From here, he surveyed the warm and cluttered main room. Herbs hung from the rafters and dried on the walls. Some he recognized, others were foreign. The witch walked over to the burning hearth. Her movements were light and quick. How did she escape the aches of age he saw in so many others? More